Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I am joined by my fantastic co host, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. Uh, but most importantly, today we are interviewing Bitcoiner Herman Vivier of Bitcoin Akazi, uh, a project I believe inspired by Bitcoin Beach, in which a Bitcoin economy is being created in South Africa. Uh, Herman, how are you doing today? How's it, man? Yeah, doing all right. Doing all right. Hanging Cracking. in there. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we like to go for a quick intro, get straight to business. Now that messing around. But yeah, I guess, um, well, the first question that will be a good place to start off will be for you to tell us, hey, Bitcoin Akazi, what's it about? What's the basics? Just so people listening can understand and get completely up to speed with the knowledge that we all have here about the, the project, the simple stuff. Yeah, cool, man. I'll give you a quick overview. Um, I mean, it's basically literally inspired directly by, <clears throat> by Bitcoin Beach. Um, we're also supported by Bitcoin Beach at the moment. Um, and we are, we're basically just trying to copy paste um, what they did in a, in a different setting. So obviously we're adapting it to local circumstances. Um, not everything is a straight copy paste, but um, yeah, it's, 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 it's an adaptation of, of what they did there. So basically we, we're trying to kickstart a Bitcoin circular economy um, in a South African township. Um, it's a very poor neighborhood. Um, and we're using as a platform, we're using a nonprofit organization that my wife and I have been running for the last 10 years. Um, so we've got a, we've got a pretty solid um, platform in the community. Uh, we've been working with with them uh, for for several years. We have coaches who have been running this program um, since 2016, 2017, um, and and we're using that NPO as a as a trusted foot in the door, um, which is kind of similar to what what how it developed with Bitcoin Beach. They had pre existing programs, um, which they then um, used to implement uh, Bitcoin in the community. Yeah, and we were talking to um, Bitcoin Lake as well, which in Guatemala, I think it was from memory. And um, similarly, they didn't have an MPO, but they were like already had been in the area quite a lot doing work. And so it, they, they kind of knew the area and, and knew um, kind of how Bitcoin could help. When it comes to where you guys are, uh, I guess when it goes back to you starting the MPO, like what's the story behind that originally with yourself and your wife like deciding to do that? Was it um like are you from like near near to the area or like what's the story around around that um we we started a business um a tourism business in 2010 and we wanted to give people who come on our on our on our trips uh, we organized two week holiday holiday surf trips and uh, we wanted to give tourists a slightly different experience um, South Africa, just as a bit of historical context, um, <clears throat> I think most people are quite familiar with the history, but it's a, it's a, it's a very, very divided society. So because of the history with apartheid, there's inequality in lots of countries around the world, but in South Africa, it's particularly pronounced. You could literally cross the highway from one side to another, um, and there would be $10 million mansions on the one side and people living in, in absolute nothing nothingness on the other side of the highway. So it's a very divided society. Um, the one thing that, that makes it strange is that, is that because of the history, the, you, you, can, you can kind of feel like you're visiting Europe when you're visiting South Africa um, because the inequality is hidden from view. It's not, it's not an obvious, um, obvious sight. Um, it's, it's normally hidden around the corner or whatever. Um, and this is also because of the historic history in South Africa. So we wanted to give tourists a... A, a taste of, of what it's really like for millions of people living in South Africa, rather than just have them have a very typical tourist experience. Um, so, so we developed the NPO with, with that idea in mind um, to incorporate that with the, with the tourism and, and give people just a, a slightly more, you know, a realistic taste of, of, of what the country um, what the country is like uh, behind the scenes, because it's really easy to miss um, traveling the regular tourist routes. Um, it's not it's not the kind of inequality that's in your face. Um, it's very pronounced, but you kind of have to seek it out to experience to experience it. Gotcha. So it sounds like it's kind of like you kind of got to yeah take some some like turns that usually tourists wouldn't take maybe, and then it's right there. 
but like oh. yeah you usually just wouldn't have to go like left and right off the side of the main street that you're told to go on maybe by like yeah. tourist guys that's, that's interesting and so then obviously you guys decide to do that to kind of give people the reality of the situation and then and show them what's going on and then it's like okay well let's also like start to set up the mpo and try to help the people in the local area kind of you know improve and, and not be in that situation which is pretty cool um so yeah i guess and then when, when was it that you realized hey this is something that i can kind of you know you, when did you see the bitcoin beach side of things and go oh this actually could work like uh, is it have you been someone who's been in, interested in bitcoin for a while or like was it bitcoin and then you found out about that then this or was it that this got you interested in bitcoin or how's this kind of story around around that like the switch from the mpo to going okay let's turn this into like a, a bitcoin related project yeah it's uh it's, it's it's an interesting question um i've i've been I've, I've been very very interested in bitcoin for for a long time um i i was originally introduced by a friend of mine who gave me a copy of bitcoin magazine in 2013 um vitalik was still writing for for the magazine back then um and and it struck me as something that that's kind of like um I don't know how to put it, but it's it's it it was a fast fascinating occurrence to me that you had this thing where there was very very strict rules according to how you could operate within the system, but those rules were not under the control of a particular group of people, and that just seemed inherently fair to me. Um, I've obviously been very interested in fairness, um, <laughs> seeing seeing the <laughs> the line of work that I'm in, um, and. Yeah, I just I, I I read up about it as much as I could, um, but I only really thought about incorporating Bitcoin into the NPO when I when I heard an interview with Michael Peterson, um, and so that was in late two thousand and nineteen for the first time I, I heard him on the on the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Um, Peter McCormack interviewed him, um, and and even even the host. Um, McCormack wasn't particularly he wasn't really sold on the idea and they were still it was still very early days um they hadn't really gotten the circular economy thing going yet um but but the idea was kind of it it, it struck me because I mean I'd, I'd obviously been into Bitcoin for a long time but I realized um that Bitcoin was going to have to be used by everyday people as an ordinary part of life if it's going to accomplish what it's promising um, to accomplish, it's not going to do much for the world if Bitcoin is just something that a fringe minority of people are investing is in as a speculation um, against the collapse of currencies or whatever. You know, it's it's actually going to have to be used on a daily basis uh, for it to develop, sort of deliver on its promise. Um, and so, when when I heard Mike talk about what they were doing. I thought that was a very clever way um, to get it into the hands of people um, who would use it as an ordinary currency rather than a speculative asset. Um, so that was yeah, that was late 2019. Um, but I kind of had to wait for the NPO to to actually get a Bitcoin donation before we could get going. I wasn't going to use funds from the NPO from the NPO's bank account to go and buy a Bitcoin to start this thing. So kind of sat with the idea and then in mid 2021 somebody um, donated some some bitcoin to to the npo and i thought okay well you know that's kind of not a risk-free way of starting it but it's it's a way that's gonna you know limit the risk as far as possible um, herman i wanted to ask you uh, you just mentioned donations is are you guys existing solely on donations as the source of Bitcoin? Because I interviewed Warren Gray of Currency, and he was explaining to me that South Africa has like some strange exchange laws, um, which creates kind of like a premium on Bitcoin. And it's harder to acquire there than it is in, in other places. Um, yeah, we are we are basically we are basically taking the donation model that we had for the NPO and just switching it over to a Bitcoin standard. So we are asking for Bitcoin, Bitcoin donations rather than fiat donations, but the, but the NPO was a hundred percent donation based before we um, started Bitcoin Ikasi. And now with Bitcoin Ikasi, it's still hundred percent donation based. It's just that the donations are coming in in Bitcoin rather than fiat. Um, 
And to your second question, yes, South Africa has very, very historic, historically very strict uh, exchange controls. Um, it's very difficult to move money in and out of the country. Um, if, if, for example, somebody donated $100 in cash um, to our NPO, I'd actually ask the person to go and exchange that for me because as a South African, I can't actually exchange foreign currency. I can't walk into a bank or a bureau to change at the airport and change currency unless I had a foreign passport. Um, and even if I had a foreign passport, um, if there was any form of permanent residence stamped in that passport, then I still wouldn't be able to change it. So yeah, exchange controls are pretty strict. It, it leads to a, it, it's not a massive premium. It's probably, a, it's probably about 5%. Um, so if you take the price of Bitcoin on international exchanges, um, and you convert the price with the dollar rand exchange rate, the Bitcoin price in South African rand is always slightly higher. Um, there is a bit of a bit of a premium on it. It's 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 historically been you are don't quote me on this, but it's probably about five five percent, not not much not much more than that. It's interesting on the different like uh, premiums that get paid in different countries and, and for the various reasons why. And I, and I know there was the. Was it this year or last year? Last year, where they they did this whole yeah the whole rule about like people had uh, exchanges and stuff couldn't like it was all to do with like uh, the money not leaving the country right there was this whole tightening up on that I saw that that occur and then I saw those people saying well actually it's uh, Bitcoin is uh, legal tender in El Salvador so does that consist as like a, a foreign currency rather than like a commodity or a, uh, et cetera et cetera so, so I thought it was quite interesting to see that um, I don't know what, what the outcome of that ever was but I know that the rules haven't changed around like uh, the Bitcoin, the crypto slash money leaving the country is part of the exchange uh, process. So I know a lot more people went uh, peer to peer in South Africa at around that time, which makes sense. And in Nigeria, the same thing happened as well around peer to peer. Yeah, there's some, um, there's some, there's some even stricter rules coming if I understand it correctly. Um, I think okay. the rule that you might be referring to is called the travel rule. So they don't. They, they actually want to try and implement it in a way that whatever Bitcoin is bought on South African exchanges is not transferred to wallets that are hosted outside of the South African jurisdiction. I don't know how they're going to try and enforce that. Um, but it's, it's something that's obviously been discussed in, in many other places around the world as well. Um, I think governments in general have quite a big problem with the, the idea of self-hosting hosting your funds <laughs> um, because if it's on the blockchain, there is no jurisdiction really. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, yeah. I think the rules are going to become even stricter. This is the thing, like a lot of uh, companies when it comes to like custody and well, a lot of the regulations in different like Southeast Asian countries. And then, as you said, South Africa has the travel rule. And a lot of it is like, uh, Oh, if you're starting an exchange in this country, you have to hold the funds in the country. And it's like, well, I mean, <laughs> how would you how do you know? I, you know it's like okay we could use a custody provider we could just you could go and use like one of the random custody like bitgo fire fire blocks whatever and then you could be like oh well where's the money and it's like well on the blockchain <laughs> i don't really like who has the paper with the keys written on them is that what we're getting at like it's a little bit weird like and i don't think they quite understand it but i saw a article from i think it was uh, on the news about the uk and then they and they apparently have no issue with self-hosted wallets or something to that effect which was at least something encouraging in this world of governments hating crypto. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting development, that's for sure. Regarding your work with um, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin Akasi, uh, how far have you come when it comes to achieving your goals? And, you know, what are the biggest challenges you face? You know, going around, you know, preaching the gospel of Bitcoin, obviously, I, from personal experience, you know, might not go down well with um, constituted authority. And so what are the biggest challenges if you faced, you know, trying to, you know, reach your goals for the circular economy? By and far, one of the biggest challenges um, is the, the belief that Bitcoin is a scam. So we, we run into that a lot. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, in, in the beginning, BitRefill was one of the most convenient and easily accessible ways to actually demonstrate to people that it's not a scam, uh, particularly because, you know, if, if, if you can buy phone credits and you can instantly exchange something for, for something like phone credits, people would, you know, sort of take notice and go, oh, that's interesting. Um, but uh, still, I mean, it's been, 
it's coming up on a year now um, that we've been 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 trying to implement this, and there's still a very very um, a, a, very, a lot of a lot of mistrust um, in in something like this. It's it's obviously unfamiliar. Um, people have a people have a general mistrust of the banking system in South Africa. So you would see, I mean, it's 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 quite strange. I'm not sure why South Africa has not really had the history with um, with banking scandals. Uh, it's 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 got a very tightly regulated banking sector, very conservative laws that govern banks. Um, but still, on, on payday, you would see long queues outside the cash machines. People literally withdraw everything from their bank account um, and would live, you know, on a day-to-day -day with physical hard cash. So something, something that's digital like Bitcoin sort of reminds people of, you know, this money that you can't touch. So they prefer paper, paper currency. Um, so that's been yeah it's it's been it's been tough to convince people that it's that it's real money. Um, that's that's been really tough. Uh, obviously, the other challenge is the volatility. Um, that's uh, that's quite a big challenge. Um, we've been trying to deal with that by just keeping things as small as possible. Um, you know, we haven't gone all out, and we haven't convinced anyone to convert their life savings into Bitcoin. <laughs> it's a it's a sort of a day to day. Um, we're trying to encourage people to use it on a daily basis, but only hold what they can afford to lose, um, if that makes sense. So if they're holding it for the long term, we kind of try and reiterate the point again and again that if you're going to hold on to this for the long term, then this should be something that you don't need um, urgently ever. Um, so it's, yeah, the volatility is a really big risk. Um, I'd say those are the two biggest two biggest challenges for sure. In El Salvador, uh, where Bitcoin Beach was inspired, the population uh, doesn't really have a lot of access to the banking system. What is the situation like in South Africa? Does the average South African have access to like a bank account or or banking services? Um, I think last time I checked, um, about forty percent of South Africa was unbanked. So it's not it's not as high a percentage, not nearly as high a percentage as 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 it is in El Salvador. South Africa has a pretty a pretty well developed uh, banking banking industry. Um, cash machines are are widespread. Um, one of the one of the very convenient things that you can do with the banking system in South Africa is you can actually send somebody cash, even if they haven't got a bank account, as long as you've got a bank account. Um, you literally send them a PIN number to their phone and then they could go to the relevant cash machine and by entering the PIN number, withdraw cash from the cash machine without actually having a bank account. Um, it's quite convenient because there are cash machines everywhere. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say South Africa has a, has a major problem with, um, with, with an unbanked population. Obviously, 40% is not insignificant. Um, it's still it's still a significant amount of of, of people in the country, um, and then obviously combined with the general distrust in the banking system, uh, a lot of people aren't actually using their bank accounts for anything other than receiving a salary and withdrawing every last cent of it the day that they receive their salary. So a lot of people would literally literally receive their pay into their bank account and then the day that they get paid they would go to the nearest atm and withdraw everything in cash um so so there is there is that there is that distrust um so but but in general in general i'd say south africa is pretty well pretty well serviced um financially it's it's not it's not not the same as what you i think in el salvador it's something like 70 percent um unbanked um, which is obviously much higher. So maybe you compare South Africa's forty, you said pro approximately, um, and the UK is approximately four. So it's like a, it's a pretty big difference from you know like what I've grown up in, uh, right? So like um, to me, if someone says forty percent, that sounds like a pretty big amount of people um, that are unbanked. Um, and it's interesting you say about like the distrust in banks and people receiving and then withdrawing their salary into into cash um i may have like zoned out for a second and missed like why that is like why is it that people have such a distrust like is there a history of um banks collapsing or like governments taking money out of the bank like in other countries or 
or, or is like why is that yeah it, it, it's 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 strange i it, it's definitely not because there's a history of of banks collapsing south africa's banking system is very very tightly regulated um the banks are quite conservative um you know interest rates have never really been below six percent here um so it's 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 quite a it's quite a conservative conservatively regulated industry so i've never experienced a bank a bank run in my lifetime and, and neither of my parents i think it's got to do with um it's it's got to do with more with a general mistrust of the government and authority figures in general. Obviously, with South Africa's history being what it is, um, you know, ninety percent of the population are black, and they have been well basically screwed over for for generations. Um, you know, first through slavery and then apartheid, um, as, as recently as you know the the early nineties, um, and so that that general mistrust of authority figures and kind of like sort of taking anything coming from an authority figure with a, with a heavy dose of skepticism. I think it's got more to do with that. Um, but that's a very generalized sentiment. I mean, it's hard to pinpoint exactly why um, people, I mean, and, and the queues are ridiculous at the cash machines on payday. It's like, you know, these massive queues, people wait hours just to withdraw their cash. It's, 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 it is strange that they don't trust the banking system maybe it's part part of it could just be like hey that's what my mom and dad did and like it's just go, like sometimes that often happens right there's like tradition in it um does that lead to like many thefts and things like that because obviously i can imagine if, if people are drawing their salaries it's like just hang out there then put like just pull out a gun and rub someone as they walk away from the cash machine like i know that was a big part of in el salvador um a part of the whole bitcoin thing was like well actually like i don't have to go to the cash machine to go get my money i can just kind of use it on my phone and not have to worry about it as much kind of thing and puts me less at risk uh, is that like a thing in south africa like people robbing people at the atm yeah it's it, it's a it's a big it's a big thing there's um i think it's um when 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 people when people see um youtube clips or whatever of of cash and transit robberies in south africa um it's it's strange but it, it does actually happen they there are there are organized gangs who who target these vehicles that literally drive around with piles of cash um it's 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 got a i mean obviously south africa like like i mentioned has got a very well developed banking sector so there are cash machines all over the place but these things have to be serviced with physical paper currency and so it is quite a common thing um cash in transit heists is is a real thing um in in the country um I think just to your point earlier, I, I know that another one of the reasons why people mistrust the banking system, and I'm not sure why this is, but banking is, is particularly expensive in South Africa. So banking fees are, um, I, was, I, I was very surprised when I was working in the UK to find out that I can actually have a bank account that doesn't cost me anything. Um, I've, got a, I've got a bank card that allows me to get cash from the ATM, I've got the, the account and, and none of it is costing me anything. I only pay fees if I withdraw cash from a, from a competing bank or whatever. Whereas in South Africa, you pay for every single transaction, you pay for every withdrawal, you pay for, you pay for every deposit. Every time you deposit money into the bank, you pay. You pay for sending money between your own bank account and somebody else's bank account every single time you do that. It's a that's the, the fees are very high so that could be one of the reasons why people don't actually I, I know it's one of the reasons why a lot of merchants don't actually accept electronic payments um and why they insist on working in cash only because they they don't actually want to lose out on the fees that makes a ton of sense yeah absolutely because yeah in the uk I think they used to have, I mean, these days, honestly, every cash machine of every bank is free. Like I, I'm, I'm with certain bank, I can go to any of the banks. You get the odd one in like petrol stations or everywhere you get charged at one pound fee, but, but otherwise it's free for everything. So yeah, I can understand then a lot more. Yeah. Why, especially why Bitcoin's more attractive too, when people understand it, because it's like, well, lightning network fee is <laughs> like nearly nothing. So it makes a lot more sense. What like what role do the surfer kids play in this? Because I've seen videos of the surfer kids using bit refill to make uh, uh, phone top ups and, and buy other stuff. And then I've also seen um, videos of, of the surfer kids. I think it was going to like convenience stores and purchasing stuff with lightning uh, directly from the merchant. 
Uh, yeah, so the Sufi kids, the, the Sufi kids, um, it's probably a good idea to clarify that. But the Sufi kids is the nonprofit that we started in 2010. Um, so my wife and I have been operating uh, that that NPO uh, since then. And basically since then, the Sufi kids mission has been really simple. Uh, we go into these really poor communities and we recruit the kids and we try and teach them surfing as a way to just, you know, learn, learn some life lessons about commitment and, and the value of long-term commitment and achieving your goals. Um, and so what Bitcoin Ekasi does, Bitcoin Ekasi basically just pays the salaries of the coaches who work for the surfer kids. So those coaches are still doing, for the most part, they, they're doing the same job that they did before, which is they teach kids how to surf. Um, but then we only we could only afford to employ one coach uh, when we were still operating on a fiat standard. So the Surfy Kids was basically operating with a single coach, a single uh, senior coach. Um, and we had some junior coaches helping, but none of them were earning anything. Um, when we started Bitcoin Ekasi, we started supplementing the senior coach's salary with Bitcoin. And we started actually paying the junior coaches for the first time with Bitcoin. And so they are still working for the surfer kids and they are still doing what they did before, which is teaching the kids from the township how to surf. Um, but they're earning their salary in Bitcoin with the idea of spending it at the shops um, that we've onboarded um, to accept Bitcoin as payment. So Bitcoin, Bitcoin Ekasi is basically just an extension of the surfer kids. The surfer kids is the, the NPO that provides the structure for us to be able to do what we do. Um, obviously, we want to get Bitcoin in the, into the community, but we want to do it in a way that's responsible. So we don't just want to hand it out to people. We want to give it to people who have actually worked for it and who have earned it. Um, and so those are the coaches. They, they've worked for it, they've earned it, and that's basically their salary. Really cool. I mean, how many how many stores or places accept Bitcoin in the local area? Would you say, like off the top, like off the top of your head, kind of thing? Not not super accurate. Um, well, I mean, I, it, it's I, I could tell you pretty accurate. It's not a big number. It's only six. Um, so it's uh, but it is it, it's a pretty small it's a pretty small community, um, and there's probably about a total of somewhere between twenty five and thirty five merchants um that we could onboard uh if we onboarded every single merchant in that community so it's it's been it's been six for about two months now i think the last time we onboarded a new shop was two months ago uh five of them are sort of little small grocery stores where you can buy your regular milk and sugar and and, and staples uh, and then one of them is a barber shop uh, where the coaches go and get their hair cut um so we are taking it really slow but we're not we're not focused on onboarding as many shops as quickly as possible because there's there would be little point in us onboarding an, an extra five shops if nobody is spending bitcoin at those shops and so at the same time as onboarding shops we've actually got to make sure that we get bitcoin into the hands of somebody who's going to go and spend it there so if we're going to onboard another shop, we, we would probably look at employing an extra person so that there's an extra person spending Bitcoin at that shop that we just onboarded. Um, it's, not the, it's, it's not the kind of area that, I mean, the, yeah, the area we operate in is really, really poor. Uh, people live in, in makeshift structures that's basically built from scrap material. Um, a lot of the places don't have running water, no flush toilets. Um, Electricity is kind of they 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 sort of you know relay elect electric cables from one place to another completely illegally very dangerous so that's that's the kind of neighborhood we're, we're operating in and it's it's not the kind of place that anybody is going to go into from the outside unless they have a very specific reason for being there which is probably that they live there so we can't we can't onboard shops and then hope that people from the outside are going to come and spend Bitcoin. That's just, that's just not going to happen. It's not, it's not that kind of area. So it's, it's a small number of shops because we've only, we've, well, we're paying about six salaries at the moment. So six salaries, six merchants, it, it sort of evens out. 
if we add one or two extra people working for Bitcoin, we'd probably add one or two extra shops accepting it. Accepting it. What, what is the total population of the people living in that area? Because from what I gather from what you're saying is that um, the goal is to, you know, put people, like you said, responsibly, put, you know, Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible responsibly. And, to, and doing that, they have to earn it. So I guess, you know, your way of, you know, having to distribute Bitcoin is to employ, you know, as many people. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking, what is the population of the people in the area, you know, that would be enough to sustain that circular economy that, you know, you're, which you're talking about? So we are, we are based in a, in a small town. Um, the town is called Mossel Bay. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not big enough to be called a city. Um, the population of, of Mossel Bay is probably about 100,000 people. So it's, it's a big town in South African terms, but I guess depending on where you're from, that could be a small town. Um, and then the community that we're based in is a township that is just outside the economic center of this town. And the, the township community is probably around, I'd say between five and 10,000 people um, at most. Um, and that's, that's, that's kind of the area we focused on because historically that's where we've always uh, recruited the children who participate in the Surfer Kids program. Um, and we've always focused on that particular area as a base for recruitment. Um, because it's walking distance from the beach where we coach the kids how to surf. So it's that access between the township and the beach that, that we've been relying on. And so we focused on the same community. Um, I'd say if we could, if, if we could probably, I mean, we could realistically employ probably about another four or five people um, without drastically changing the the structure of of what we do and the way in which we do it um obviously you know the organization can grow bigger than that um but if we employ about another four or five people we'd probably reach our current sort of structural limit um and then then hopefully the aim is to you know to start circularizing the economy so that the people who are receiving bitcoin also go out and spend it and then those people go out and spend that and they go out so one of like just as a little small example one one of the shop owners that have been accepting bitcoin from us since last year august um has actually started using it now for her day to day so she she, she got a haircut from the barber that we onboarded so there's an exchange between two people using bitcoin and neither one of them are directly related to us. Um, they're just accepting Bitcoin from our coaches. I mean, I don't, I don't know at what point does this become a circular thing. Um, I, I don't know what the numbers need to be for that to happen. Um, but I guess there's a certain threshold. And as long as you're below that threshold, it's always going to be this little thing that you have to keep powering and if you stop then the whole thing falls flat and then if you go above that threshold then maybe it starts powering itself I, I don't know i don't know but are there plans to establish you know similar you know uh, projects like the one you have you're doing currently in other parts of south africa you know with similar problems of in you know wealth in this where they have wealth serious wealth gap and you know when you know poverty is rife in you know areas so that because um from what I, from what i understood what bitcoin beach is doing basically establishing a circle economy in a place where you know tourists would come and and as far as i can tell the place is thriving do you do you plan to establish similar things in different locations within south africa um i'm not sure if we'll move to different places um we'll probably focus on the community where we're at at the moment until we've got that entire community um, onto a Bitcoin standard, if that's even possible. Um, I would like to see the idea being copied by other people um, to implement similar things in other parts of the country. That, that would be really cool. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons I, I, I think, one, probably one of the main reasons I started it's because I thought that it would be a great example for people to, to see how this thing can be applied in real life. Um, in a way that's relatively simple. I mean, it's, you know, we didn't, we didn't reinvent the wheel or anything. We just, you know, basically just instead of paying people in fiat, we started paying them in Bitcoin and we, you know, convinced a few shops to accept it as payment. And, and hopefully, hopefully that model sort of spreads to other parts of the country. 
Um, but for our purposes, I mean, I would like to see it spread a little bit wider than just the little community we focused on. Um, tourism is quite a big interest industry in this part of the country. So I think there is room for, for what happened in El Salvador to be repeated here. Um, but I, I can't see us growing beyond our community for the time being. Um, a question I had is what wallet are, are you guys using to, to onboard people? Um, what lightning wallet are you guys using? Yeah, I've, I've never been super technical. So every, everything we've done has always been sort of um, plug and play. Uh, whatever, whatever we can find on the, on, the, on, on the Google Play Store is what we've used to, to run our project. So we, we're, using, we're using quite a few different wallets. Um, we, started off, we started off with Moon Wallet. Uh, we found that a little bit impractical because the merchants had to issue invoices. And so we started looking for a wallet where they could have a static uh, Allen URL code. Um, but we, we, we were quite limited in our options because we also had to have con conversion rates within the wallet to local currency. So obviously we couldn't, we couldn't expect merchants to do conversions between dollar and rand. Um, so a lot of the wallets wasn't actually, couldn't actually convert into local currency. So eventually, we were using a combination of Lightning Tipot, Blue Wallet, and now more recently Wallet of Satoshi. Um, Wallet of Satoshi very recently added a static Allen URL um, um, codes to their Lightning wallets. Um, so yeah, Wallet of Satoshi, Lightning Tipot, which is based on Telegram, um, Blue Wallet, Moon. Um, those are the ones that that we've we've used and are still using maybe i mean i don't have the ability to to take the galloway software and fork it into a a bitcoin ekasi wallet i know there are other projects that have done that bitcoin jungle bitcoin i think bitcoin lake has also done that now um that'd be great um but for the time being you know we're basically using stuff we download off the google play store pretty much do you think you can help with that get in touch <laughs> That's, yeah. uh, that sounds like the, the answer to that one. I mean, I, I don't think I'm quite good enough to do that myself either. But um, yeah, if anyone out there is experienced with forking wallets or yeah, or even the guys at uh, Galloway, have you spoken to the guys at Galloway about that at all or not really? Like, is that the sort of conversation you've had? We have we have spoken about it. I think I think, I think the, the biggest challenge is actually um, hosting the back end. Um, so using using the software itself, or forking the software itself, and um, changing a few bits and pieces to to suit our purposes wouldn't be wouldn't be such a big headache. But I think you know hosting the back end and the servers for that that's you know obviously something that 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 costs cost money. Um, so we haven't we haven't we have had some conversations, but. But not many. There are some people that have shown interest in in helping with that. Um, but I mean, I think it'll happen at at the right time. Um, when when the time is right, somebody will come forward and say, "Hey, look, I want to help with that." And um, yeah, I mean, as long as we keep doing what we're doing, eventually the right person will will put their hand up. Um, so yeah, I'm not not too not too rushed about that. I think what we are using at the moment works fine as long as it's a relatively small project. You know, if we're going to try and onboard a hundred shops, then it's going to be difficult to do it in the way that we're doing it at the moment. Um, but with it only being six stores and and six coaches, it it works all right uh, for the time being. One one of the like most important things that kind of helped get Bitcoin Beach off the ground in El Salvador was uh, Jorge and Roman and others like going out and talking to the people and having like an educational outreach. Are you guys doing any sort of uh, Bitcoin education? Uh, yeah, one hundred percent. So I mean, I I basically just just run the admin side of things. Um, I do the social media um, and I do most of the communication, um, you know, stuff like this, the podcast and so on. But that's only because I've got a bit of a history with Bitcoin. Um, but the, the, the work on the ground 
is being done by by our coaches. So when they're not when they're not coaching the kids to surf, they'd actually be up in the township, um, communicating with merchants, talking with people on the street. Um, you know, we've done things where they would walk around and just have conversations with any anyone that would listen. Um, and demonstrate how bit refill works, for example. That's one of their one of their favorite things to do because it's it's a very it's a very the response they get from people is is very positive when when they can show this person that hey I can actually use this thing and this is how it works and I can use it to buy airtime or put credits for the phone. Um, so it I wouldn't I wouldn't say I mean those are obviously educational efforts, but it's not it's it's sort of more in a practical sense it's a it's a practical they, they're basically just demonstrating to people how to use it in the ways that they've been using it but they're not they're not talking about you know the block size limit or um you know the the idea of smart contracts you know is it a worthwhile idea to pursue on chain or should it be on second layer you know, stuff like that it's not that's not that's not the kind of education that they that they're focused on it's it's all about like day-to-day practical things like how how do i buy airtime with bit refill how do i the cash out with packs full how do i you know do things you know back up my wallet for example um things like that um that's that's done we've got we've got one senior coach um who does most of that he's his name is lutando um he's actually i would have to credit him with doing most of the the work on the ground um yeah, I would, it would have been great for him to be here as well. It's tough to get him on the podcast, though, because he's busy from nine in the morning until five in the afternoon with the kids uh, most of the time. Um, but yeah, he's he's the guy doing most of the work on the ground. Um, but Refill has actually also helped um, the, you guys probably know Steve that runs the local office here in South Africa. Um, he's been very helpful. We we produced a, a little 10 minute Bitcoin explanatory video in Tosa and other African languages like Zulu and Sutu, uh, which, which he helped with. Um, so, yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think those videos it's, I've, I don't think I've ever seen the kids as quiet for, for 10 minutes as when they watch that for the first time, because I mean, every, everything that you hear and read and see that's Bitcoin related is, is in English. Um, and so that was the first time um, that they actually encountered something in their own language. Um, you know, 95% of them speak English as a second or third language. Um, so it's not, it's not their mother tongue. So that was, that was a massive, massive thing for us. I think that video is, is, is having, it's hard to measure the impact of the video because the majority of people that are seeing it in the community are not watching it on YouTube. We're we're passing around physical copies of it, you know. So the coaches are walking around and they they're physically copying it from device to device to device. Um, obviously, because you know, phone credit is is quite expensive, so they don't want to use data to to do that. So, but it's having it's definitely having a really big impact on the ground, um, and it's such a valuable thing um, because it's 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 oral, so it takes less concentration for somebody to to take in the information. Um, literacy is also obviously quite a challenge. So, you know, there's a lot of people who can't necessarily read very well, but they understand their mother language, um, obviously. So if you can explain to them something in, in, in a verbal way, uh, they would be a lot more receptive than if you gave them a pamphlet, for example. Um, so that, that, that video has done, has done a, a, a hell of a lot of good. And I mean, the coaches spend at least one day a week uh, walking around the township, literally just trying to copy, copy that video onto as many different devices as possible. I mean, if if it's possible, we would like to get a hard copy of that onto every digital device in the township. Um, so we'll see. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's done a lot of good for sure. Uh, do 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 you find um, actually? I guess yeah. Two questions. I mean, first off, do you find that? Um... Because often, often with uh, less well off communities, like people, they can, there's often like a lot of scams and like they're rife with like people like, oh, buy, you know, Shibi shit coin, whatever. And it's like, yeah, I guarantee it's going to make, you know, thousands. And I remember like listening to one of the um, 
podcast about one coin that the BBC did a few years ago or a year ago. And uh, in that they went to, I can't remember where actually, but somewhere in the African continent. Uh, and they were talking, it was like uh, some of the local priests and like uh, people were actually preaching and stuff had, had started selling this like scam as well. And so I know there's a lot of that that goes on. Do you find that people ever kind of react negatively to what you guys are doing being like oh it's clearly just gonna be another one of these scams is that like an issue that you guys come across or is it not as much because you're probably not promising returns of anything you're saying be careful but here's a little bit and you can use it to to buy stuff as i'll leave it at that question for now uh yeah 100 um the the bitcoin is a scam is it's it's one of the biggest biggest challenges we have to convince people that it's not um so yeah, we, 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 we encounter a lot of that, unfortunately. Um, South Africa has, has produced two of the biggest uh, crypto scams in, in the history of the space. Uh, the one was uh, M- a, a company that called itself MTI. Um, they, they claimed to generate you know, returns of 1.5% uh, per day with a trading bot, specialized trading bot. <laughs> Um, they still they stole billions and billions of rands, and unfortunately, most of that happened through Bitcoin. Um, so they would actually ask people for their deposits in Bitcoin. Um, at one point, it was so bad that people were using the name of that company and Bitcoin interchangeably. So at one point, if you were talking about Bitcoin, people would assume that this is the company that you're talking about because this company is Bitcoin. Like this is what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is this thing that you pay to these guys and then they generate this ridiculous return. So that, that, that went bust, that scam went bust in, in early 2020. Um, and then about a year later, there was this thing called AfriCrypt, which is also a massive scam. And you know, un- unfortunately, they target uh, poorer communities. Um, people are more desperate and literacy financial literacy is a bigger problem so you know unfortunately it, it's it, it is a very cruel cruel irony that these scams are more proliferate in the communities that can least afford it yeah it's uh it's an awful but common situation isn't it really it feels like where that happens as you say simply yeah the financial literacy is lower and if people are desperate then you know, if you're, if you're desperate, for example, to buy a loaf of bread and someone says, yeah, yeah, just give me like this, and I can give you 20 loaves of bread. You're like, uh, okay. <laughs> you know, whereas if, you, if you've got more loaves of bread at home, you're going to maybe sit and think about it longer. You've got better time preference. Um, have, you, have you found uh, that, well, has, has anyone, as you said uh, earlier, it's not the sort of place people would usually just kind of visit. Like if you're going to go there, it's because you live there. Have you found, have you found any, uh, that anyone has visited like because of this Bitcoin project yet? Like has anyone come to see the area yet at all? Uh, or has anyone contacted you about that yet? Uh, yeah, we've had, we've had one or two people that have uh, visited from overseas. Um, We've had people who were just traveling through the area and were very curious to see what's what's going on. Um, I've I've had I've had some positive experiences with that. Um, you know, we we have because we've always had the NPO and it's been linked to our tourism business. We have in the past taken people up to these areas to show them where the kids come from. But generally, the experience, it, it, it's been a very mixed bag of results. Uh, people sometimes don't appreciate it. Um, it kind of feels like you're going there to show them how people live. But what's the point? Because everybody knows that people suffer and there's poverty and so on. Um, but with, with the Bitcoin Ekasi project, is it, it feels like when people visit this particular community, it's, it's, a, lot more, it's, it's a lot more of a positive experience. Um, like there's a reason for going to visit that area now um, because it, it really is truly quite interesting to see that something like this can be adopted in in a community like this where you would least expect it um, you know which is also sort of one of the reasons why I started it because I, I thought to myself that if 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 Bitcoin can work here it can work anywhere so there's no there's no real there's no real excuse for somebody in a middle class neighborhood not to use it from a technical perspective 
if if it can work in in a very very poor community like this then from a technical perspective there's no reason why anyone can't use it so um so there's been there's been a i'd say a more more authentic reason for people to come and visit um this this particular community uh, whereas before it, it it always felt a bit strange to take people there um, and to show them where the kids come from um, because it, it really is a very desperate situation that you know it's, it's it's the poorest of the poor that we have traditionally um worked with i've always wanted to i've always wanted to do this sort of thing in in the area that that needs it most you know um, I don't want to go to a middle class neighborhood and do this because what's the point? I want to go to the, you know, the lowest of the low. Um, so it is, it is a really desperate situation. And it's, it's nice to see that people have a positive experience from visiting now um, with the Bitcoin and Cassie project, whereas before that wasn't always the case. Uh, I had, uh, well, a two part question. First of all, what does the word Akasi mean? And then uh, second, like how has the volatility in, in the last few months kind of impacted people's response towards towards Bitcoin? Uh, the word Ekasi um, is a derivative of the Afrikaans word Lukasi. Um, Afrikaans is uh, based on Dutch. It's about 70% Dutch. Uh, it's spoken mostly by white people in South Africa. There is also a segment of the colored population that speak Afrikaans, uh, but but it's traditionally seen as a as, as a white white language. Um, the word Lukasi um, in English means location, so people started using the word to refer to these communities that were always located on the outskirts of big economic centers. Um, because of South Africa's past, uh, it was it was legal for a person of color to come in and work in the city, but it was illegal for them to live there. So if you had had a cleaning lady cleaning your house and you lived in a white neighborhood and she was black, she could come in and spend the day and work, but then she'd have to leave the perimeters of the city um and so what what ended up happening was these slums um sort of grew on the outskirts of the cities so people would live in one of these slums and then work inside the city but they'd have to leave by a certain time um and and that's kind of still the case unfortunately uh not a lot has changed in that regard it's kind of like this you know 25 year hangover that south africa has from from the apartheid time and so the word lukasi refers to one of these locations but the word has been taken and changed from lukasi to ekasi which is it, it it's 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 sort of it's it's one of those interesting cases where people would take a word that comes from the oppressors but they make the word their own to refer to themselves in a way that's more positive than what the word was originally meant to mean so today the word ekasi refers to one of these locations but it it's a reference to the fact that life kind of happens on the street so there's always music playing there's always people cooking food on the street you know animals are running all over the place but no one cares um you know people suffer and struggle but they still smile um it's kind of it's kind of a reference to the vibe of the township so an, an ekasi is a township with a vibe a slum a slum with a vibe is an ekasi so if you say i'm going to the ekasi then it means you're going to the you're going to the slums but there's a good vibe <laughs> if, if that makes any sense that's that's sort of the the meaning of the word um your second question was about volatility and the response people have um yeah we've obviously we, we we have had to um you know some of the shop owners have been reimbursed to a certain extent so we have made that commitment um to get this thing off the ground we realized that the shop owners are the ones that take on the biggest risk um the coaches who we pay in bitcoin they earn their salaries on a weekly basis so the volatility doesn't affect them too much because 
most of what they earn today, they'll spend tomorrow or the day after that, or the day after that. Um, whereas the shop owners are the ones who've actually got to manage their stock um, and they've got a turnover um, to think about, etc. cetera. Um, and so the ones that have taken the biggest hits when this volatility happens, we've, we've had to sort of make them whole. Um, so the response has been generally positive because we've tried to show a lot of support. We understand that we're introducing something that is completely new and it's going to take time for people to get used to get used to it. Um, but interestingly enough, you know, there is one shop owner who's been on board with us the longest and it's a woman. Uh, her name is Nosifle. Um, and I, I was quite, I was very surprised when, when I was told how much Bitcoin she's holding on to. It's a significant amount of Bitcoin. Um, and, sh and she was actually very calm about it the first time we had that big drop in, um, I think it, did, it dropped down from over 700,000 Rand. So it dropped from about 50 to 42. Um, and then again, from about 42,000 to about 30,000 more recently. And those were two two big drops close to each other, and she was she was pretty calm about it. Um, you know, I think um, when we onboarded her, she she experienced some of that volatility very quickly and early on. Um, and I think it's something that she's just accepted as as part of the you know sort of part of the package. Um, this is something that that she's decided to invest in for a long time. So she understands that whatever she's holding is something that she's going to be holding for a long time. She's either going to spend it this week or she's going to hold on to it for years. Um, and I think she understands that, you know, there's, there's a big opportunity there, but it comes with a certain amount of risk. Um, and I'm not sure how or why, but she seems to have accepted that pretty well. Um, and she's holding on to more Bitcoin than any of the other shop owners. Um, and so they kind of like looking at her for, for a sense of guidance. Uh, so, so generally the response hasn't been, has been too, I mean, we've, we haven't, we haven't lost the shop yet. We've never, we've never onboarded a shop to accept Bitcoin. And then the owner turned around at the later stage and said, no, I don't want to accept this anymore. All the shops that we've onboarded so far have stayed on board. Um, so, you know, but I mean, you've got to remember it's a, it's, a, it's a small part of their turnover that's coming in Bitcoin at the moment. It's not a significant part of their turnover. So the volatility is, is, is the, the risk to the volatility is, is, is fairly limited. Uh, how common are like mobile uh, electronic payments, like QR code payments and stuff like that? Uh, I know in like Asia, in Latin America, there's uh, quite a few different apps that allow you to pay mobile to mobile. Is this like a new concept to people in South Africa or are there apps like that that kind of existed before they got exposed to Bitcoin? There are a lot of apps like that. Mobile payments is, is quite common, but not, not in the, the sphere that we are operating in. In the sphere that we're operating in, it's, you know, it's 99.99% paper cash, um, hard physical currency. That's, that's generally the only thing people would use. So scanning a QR code to make a payment, um, it's not a strange thing for a middle-class South African, but for somebody in the community that we're operating in, it's a very strange thing to scan a QR code and, and make a payment. Um, and I think, I think it's actually one of the reasons why the shops are, are curious to start off with, because they, I mean, you can imagine from the perspective of somebody who uses only paper currency, it's quite limiting. There's a lot of things you can't do with paper money because it's physical. Um, and, and when they encountered this digital payment system for the first time, that's cheap to use, um, not expensive like their traditional experience with banking, they, they are quite intrigued by this. Um, I think a lot of them, enjoy the experience of of making digital payments for the first time um, it kind of it feels empowering to be able to do something that should really be normal by now um, and and is normal except for these little pockets of society that's still um, at least in south africa that's still you know 100 uh, cash based so 
Yeah, I think it's 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 a it's 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 a strange experience in the community where we're at, but generally speaking in the country, not at all. Um, I think and you know, most people have mobile phones. Um, it's not it's not such a strange thing. We have had to we have had to upgrade one or two of the shop owners with a slightly better phone. Um, you know, just for for obvious reasons you know if you've got a really crap phone you, you know you don't want the phone to die in the middle of the transaction um but generally speaking most people have have access to these devices and they're pretty cheap these days yeah you can pick up smartphones really low prices uh these days especially like some of the because i know there's ones that um there's different operating systems as well but there's it's Google's Android and there's iPhone. Then there's also that other operating system in like some of the much, much cheaper phones. I can't remember the name of it, but, um, but yeah, there's also that available. Um, yeah, well, we're running about an hour. Um, so it's probably a good time to, to wrap up, but, um, yeah, I, I appreciate you coming on home. It's been awesome to hear about the project and like understand where you guys came from. And I say like one thing to really get out there to anyone listening is, Hey, if there's any way you think you can help get in touch, uh, and wh where can people get in touch with you? Uh, we've got a Twitter profile, um, with Kwane Kasi. Uh, that's been the main sort of way that we've tried to reach out to, um, to the Bitcoin community and then build a bit of an audience. Uh, we've also got a website, bitcoinekasi.com. Um, we've had some troubles with the domain. So uh, alternative domain is bitcoin-bay.org, um, which has proven a bit a bit more reliable. But yeah, I mean, anybody want to reach out, um, please do. Um, I don't always respond within <laughs> within an hour. Um, it's it, It's been a little bit overwhelming, to be honest. Um, I didn't think that I, I didn't think the effort would would draw as much attention as it did within the first couple of months. Um, so it, it's been slightly overwhelming, but uh, yeah, please reach out. Happy. Absolutely, and anyone, yeah. So anything really. It sounds like anything to do with the wallet, anything to do with donations. Um, yeah, anything to do with it. Essentially, it sounds like anyone could be of use, and. Um, yeah, Bitcoin Akazi spelled E K A S I, I believe, um, which is right. So yeah, Bitcoin Akazi, Bitcoin E K A S I, Twitter, and as you said, dot com hopefully works. So yeah, thanks, thanks for coming on. It's I, I've 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 enjoyed it. I've learned a lot of new things about uh, another new uh, Bitcoin area. Hopefully, we'll be doing these podcasts for a little while, and then we're gonna go. Well, there's too many Bitcoin places now. Bitcoin's just you know accepted everywhere. So f it, you know. There's no point doing a podcast about that anymore. That's the the dream. But for now, it's still a unique thing and it's still awesome to hear about. And hopefully it can expand or you can get other projects nearby that kind of it starts to merge and then people are crossing over and, and kind of paying and, and you're creating that circular economy that runs itself. Um, but yeah, thanks to you. Thanks to everyone out there for listening. We appreciate you. We hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new today. I uh, hope you have an amazing uh, day, week, month, year. Uh, keep loving life, keep being happy, and most of all, keep buying Bitcoin. Take care, and we'll see you later. Mm -hmm.